So I hope you all see my uh, my slides. Here are my uh, disclosures. So TTP is a, a specific form of a thrombotic uh, microangiopathy, which is characterized by the association of a profound peripheral thrombocytopenia that results from the formation of microthrombi in organs that lead to a multi-organ failure of variable severity. And uh, red blood cells uh, crash on these uh, microthrombi and generate a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with uh, schistocytes. And you have in this disease a biomarker, which is a severe deficiency in the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease Adamstatin. And according to the mechanism of the uh, deficiency, you can have the uh, congenital form of the disease in which uh, you have uh, bialylic mutations of the encoding gene. This was formerly called the upshaw schulman syndrome that typically occurs in neonates and in uh, pregnant women and which incidence is of around one case per 10 million habitants per year. And the other form is the autoimmune form of the disease on which patients uh, develop autoantibodies against adam statin this autoimmune disease occurs typically in young women uh, on uh, typically in childbearing age women this disease is rapidly and spontaneously uh, fatal and the incidence of new cases is around one to two cases per million habitants per year which represents in france a bit more than 120 new patients per year so let's start by the autoimmune form. <laughs> so this is the uh, clinical uh, picture of these uh, patients. So as I told, uh, patients are typically uh, childbearing age women, which have uh, globally uh, 40 years old. Patients may uh, typically have uh, organ uh, involvement, organ failure and typically uh, cerebral involvement. You can see that uh, 20 years ago, uh, up to 90% of patients could have cerebral involvement, whereas uh, 10 years later, uh, only 50% of patients have cerebral involvement. Uh, and this is because uh, we learned to uh, make the diagnosis of the disease earlier and earlier when patients only have hematological features. So this means that we uh, became more aware about the diagnosis of the disease and we diagnose it before organ involvement. And this is a good point, of course, for the patients. <coughs> Biologically, patients have a profound cytopenias and typically a profound thrombocytopenia. And on the opposite, a mild renal involvement. And all these uh, uh, features uh, could be used to uh, derive clinical scores aimed at identifying TTP from other forms of thrombotic microangiopathy, especially the hemolytic uremic syndrome. <laughs> this is a crucial aspect because as you know, uh, the diagnosis of TTP is made on the base of adam statin activity but there's some turnaround time to have uh, Adam Sutin uh, activity, activity available, which is typically around three to five days around the world at the best. Uh, and this is in contrast with the fact that we need to make the diagnosis of the disease immediately to start in emergency targeted therapies in this disease. So this is why uh, it has been very important and interesting to uh, set up clinical scores that are now uh, uh, used in uh, routine to manage those patients. And these scores, are uh, the user is supported by the last ISTH guidelines for the diagnosis of TTP published two years ago. So far, there are two clinical scores uh, available, the French score and the plasmic uh, score. And uh, those two scores uh, basically tell the same story. 
they state that in a patient with features of thrombotic microangiopathy and no associated condition, a severe thrombocytopenia below 30,000 and a mild renal involvement are systematically associated with a severe adamsetin deficiency. So you can see that these scores are very easy to use and uh, can uh, uh, are able to uh, predict a severe adamsetin uh, deficiency in real time. So again, uh, they should be used now largely uh, in the management of these, uh, of these patients. So this is a very important slide that you have to keep in mind because this is what you need to know to save a patient with a TTP. It's important because as you will see in a moment, uh, the uh, therapeutic regimens now to treat TTP are so efficient that once a patient has started the treatment for TTP, death is exceptional. Okay, and typically, and this is a, a, a typical situation in France, most of the deaths that occur in the context of TTP, uh, uh, they occur uh, uh, before the treatment was started, typically because of a diagnostic delay. So uh, it is mandatory to fight against uh, uh, a delay in the diagnosis of the disease. So in other words, do not miss the diagnosis of TTP because treatment is very efficient and you have all the chances to save the patient uh, by starting the treatment. So keep in mind that in a patient with thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia or even only hemolysis, you have to search for schistocytes in this context. And if they are positive, of, of course, think about TTP until you rule out TTP on the basis of adamsetin activity. Again, if you have thrombocytopenia and anemia and organ failure, think about TTP first, even if schistocytes are formally negative. Okay, so once you uh, uh, made the diagnosis of TTP, you did the most difficult uh, aspect of the management. The second point is that you have to refer the patient to or contact a trained team for uh, the management of the disease. So this is the uh, pathophysiological basis of uh, TTP uh, treatment. So in these patients, uh, uh, you have antibodies that inhibit the uh, enzyme activity and thereby uh, uh, the substrate of the enzyme, the high molecular weight von Willebrand factor multimers accumulate upstream. They are hyperadhesive against uh, platelets and they induce microtrombi in most organs. So in those patients, you have to uh, 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 replenish adamstatin levels to saturate uh, the antibodies against adamstatin and to cleave the large VWF multimers. And this can be achieved by bringing very large volumes of plasma to uh, uh, provide patients exogenous adamstatin. And this is made through a plasma exchange. The second strategy is immunomodulation to block the formation of antibodies against the enzyme. <laughs> and so far, the most popular uh, immunosuppressive regimen is the association of steroids and rituximab. And lastly, uh, the third strategy is to inhibit the interaction between VWF and platelets. And this could be achieved by uh, the development of a nanobody called caplacizumab. So caplacizumab is a nanobody made of two heavy chain variable domains derived from uh, camels that are both uh, directed against the A1 domain of VWF. And these two heavy chain domains are linked with an alanine bound. And this is caplacizumab. So this dimmer is able to recognize the A1 domain of uh, uh, VWF, uh, which prevents its binding with the GP1B on platelets. So caplacizumab, as you can see, can prevent the formation of new microtrombi. So caplacizumab has been evaluated on two uh, international trials, Titan and Hercules. And here is the primary endpoint uh, of both uh, studies. This is the integrated analysis. 
And you can see that uh, patients in the caplacizumab arms, this is the black uh, continuous curve, uh, those patients normalized platelet count faster than patients in the uh, uh, placebo arms. And interestingly, you can see that the uh, caplacizumab was particularly efficient at the beginning of the management during the uh, two first weeks of the management. And this is interesting because this window of time corresponds to the uh, period during which rituximab is not efficient yet. Okay, this is important because, because during this two weeks period, rituximab is still not efficient and patients can worsen than co their condition and experience refractoriness, death and exacerbations. So, caplacizumab is actually able to protect patients until rituximab improves adamstatin activity. So, caplacizumab has to be seen definitely as a compound that uh, makes a bridge until rituximab is efficient. So these features translate, as you can see, in uh, less unfavorable outcomes at the acute phase of the disease. In the caplacizumab arms, you have no deaths reported in the trials, no refractoriness, and much less exacerbations under plasma exchange. As you can see, in, with caplacizumab, patients experience less than 6% of exacerbations versus almost 35% of exacerbations in the placebo arms. So this means that caplacizumab at the acute phase allows to uh, protect patients from death, refractoriness, and exacerbations because it improves durably platelet count. So this is a slide that shows you when to, you can stop caplacizumab as after uh, you stopped uh, plasma exchange. You have to stop uh, caplacizumab when adamstatin activity reaches a protective level, which is considered to be around 20%. This is an empirical definition. And you can see here from our experience that 50% uh, of patients reach 20% of adamstatin activity at day 28 after the last PEX session, which means that 50% of patients will need more than four weeks of caplacizumab after the last PEX, and 10% of patients need more than two months after the last PEX session, which raises some concerns, of course, uh, regarding the price of the compound and some uh, potential uh, side effects. Thereafter, uh, one has to offer these patients a long-term follow-up because uh, um, one to two years after <coughs> the uh, rituximab course, adamstatin activity may uh, drop, uh, and this may expose patients to uh, clinical relapses. So, uh, it is now a strong recommendation to uh, uh, offer a regular follow-up of these patients to assess adamstatin activity, typically once every three months, to uh, ensure that uh, adamstatin activity remains within normal values. And if the enzyme activity drops during follow-up, one has to offer these patients a preemptive infusion of rituximab that allows to uh, 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 normalize adamstatin activity in virtually all cases, which protects patients from relapses. And you can see here from uh, historical patients that uh, if you leave patients without a preemptive treatment and with a an, uh, uh, severe adamstatin deficiency, almost all patients in the end relapse from the disease. And we experience some deaths in this group. So definitely now patients have to uh, need a long-term follow-up and uh, they have to be treated with preemptive rituximab if uh, adamstatin activity drops. So let's move now to uh, congenital uh, TTP. This disease was uh, formerly named uh, the upshaw schulman syndrome uh, from the name of the two uh, clinicians that uh, uh, who uh, described the, the disease. 
until uh, Galia Levy showed in 2001 that uh, actually these patients had BLLIC mutations of the encoding gene. So now the disease is called uh, congenital uh, TTP. So besides the B cytopenia, those patients also have uh, organ involvement. And given the uh, constitutive uh, severe enzyme deficiency, these patients have a chronic organ involvement. And uh, this results on uh, several comorbidities uh, in these patients that are uh, prevalent. And from a very recent uh, uh, reports of uh, experience uh, through uh, uh, many uh, groups in the world. Uh, we now know that uh, these patients typically have uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases such as uh, hypertension, uh, myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, transient ischemic uh, attack. They have uh, cerebral complications including uh, epileptic uh, seizure, headache and so on. They have chronic renal failure, including dialysis and sometimes renal transplantation. And this, of course, has a strong impact on quality of life and even on life expectancy. And this simply results from a, a huge diagnostic delay first, and on the fact that, as we will see, uh, current uh, plasma therapy is not uh, efficient enough in preventing these complications. These uh, recent works from the International Registry and from the Japanese cohort clearly show that current prophylactic plasma regimens uh, are not uh, optimal, uh, again, to, to uh, protect those patients from uh, comorbidities. Just look at this picture here. You can see that in men or in uh, women, uh, despite a regular prophylaxy with uh, plasma, you can see that all of these circles here represent relapses of the disease. And you can clearly see here that despite plasma prophylaxy, patients relapse from the disease. And this again translates on organ failure, chronic organ failure, and uh, a shortened life expectancy. So we need new compounds to uh, treat uh, better these patients. <coughs> so the, the current treatment is, the, uh, is plasma infusion that brings the exogenous uh, un uh, missing enzyme. It's a cumbersome uh, procedure, which is uh, lifelong. It needs uh, regular uh, hospitalizations, so of course it impacts the quality of life. And uh, there are also uh, some uh, side effects that are associated with this uh, procedure, including uh, fluid overload, allergy, infections. So uh, there's clearly here a need uh, to uh, alleviate the management of these patients. So there is clearly a uh, new hope in the management of this uh, disease based on, on the soon availability of the recombinant uh, of a recombinant form of uh, Adam statin. So this is uh, the, 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 the very first uh, trial that has been uh, published on this uh, on this way. It's a phase one trial that reports the tolerance, of uh, treatment with uh, recombinant ADAMS13. So the main results of this uh, phase one study are that on those patients who receive a single infusion of recombinant ADAMS13, the compound was well tolerated with no uh, uh, immunogenicity. Uh, the half-life of the uh, recombinant protein uh, was found comparable to this of the well-type protein and on those patients who had a mild thrombocytopenia and an increased LDH level, soon after the, uh, the enzyme infusion, these values normalized. So from this uh, study, all the lights were green to set up an uh, international trial that evaluated the efficacy of this recombinant protein versus plasma infusion in congenital TTP. 
So the results, of course, are expected uh, very soon. And uh, we eagerly hope that uh, this uh, uh, compound will uh, change uh, uh, um, in depth the management of these patients. So in conclusion, uh, with the current uh, highly active treatments, most patients survive from the acute phase of uh, a TTP, especially from the autoimmune form of the disease. However, death still occur as a result of a diagnostic delay. Keep in mind that once the treatment is started, deaths are exceptional. Most deaths occur before the treatment could be started. So, to make clinicians more aware of TTP diagnosis is a major goal to improve the prognosis of the disease. <coughs> Targeted therapies based on anti-VWF agents, typically caplacizumab, and the recombinant adamstatin soon that are efficient immediately, nicely prevent unfavorable outcomes in TTP. And the next steps now are to monitor adamstatin activity to personalize caplacizumab regimen. And we are even uh, uh, foreseeing uh, PEX-free regimens and even plasma-free regimens, uh, given the efficacy of these new agents. So with those uh, new highly efficient therapeutic regimens, again, the only limiting factor to improve early prognosis of TTP is the time to diagnosis. So again, in conclusion, to fight against diagnosis delay is now the most crucial issue in TTP. Thank you for your attention.